In its editorial of 28th August 1997, French daily Le Monde wrote that, quote, the light will never be shed on the massacres perpetrated against the Hutu refugees in autumn 1996 in former Zaire during the long march of Laurent Désiré Kabila to power. The writer went on saying, quote, but the light will not be shed and justice will never be administered because no single state wishes to do so, end of quote. The journalist was not totally wrong because the 1997 report by Chilean lawyer Roberto Garreton was thwarted. That lawyer had concluded that Hutu refugees had been victims of acts of genocide. That was of course at the time when the Triple K axis, Ka Guta Museveni in Ka Mpala, Ka Game in Ki Gali, and Ka Bila and Ki Nshasa was perceived by some of their backers as embodying the so-called new African leadership. It is in this framework that many African leaders use their diplomatic powers to put the massacres of hundreds of thousands of Hutu in brackets. Among them, don't be shocked, former South African President Nelson Mandela. According to the aforementioned Le Monde's editorial, quote, Nelson Mandela fully supports President Kabila to the extent of publicly doubting the reality of the alleged massacres, end of quote. But as a random proverb suggests, yesterday is not today. They managed to thwart the Garreton report, but they failed to thwart the recent mapping exercise report by the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, which has just come to the same conclusions as the Garreton report. It even cites this Garreton report. There's no denying that ethnic massacres were committed and that the victims were mostly Hutus from Burundi, Rwanda and Zaire. The Joint Mission's preliminary opinion is that some of these alleged massacres could constitute acts of genocide, end of quote. The recent report is also very clear and firm in its findings. It is therefore possible to assert that even if only a part of the Hutu population in Zaire was targeted and destroyed, it could nonetheless constitute a crime of genocide if this was the intention of the perpetrators. Finally, several incidents listed also seem to confirm that the numerous attacks were targeted at numbers of the Hutu ethnic group as such. Although at certain times the aggressors said they were looking for the criminals responsible for the genocide committed against the Tutsis in Rwanda in 1994, the majority of the incidents reported indicate that the Hutus were targeted as such with no discrimination between them. And later on, the majority of the victims were children, women, elderly people and the sick who posed no threat to the attacking forces. Numerous serious attacks on the physical or psychological integrity of members of the group were also committed with a very high number of Hutus shot, raped, burned or beaten. And then later again, such acts certainly suggest premeditation and a precise methodology. The report also lists names of localities and dates all familiar to the survivors of that genocide. Ruchuru, October 1996, Mugogo, November 1996, Musekera and Kiringa, Kabaraza, Hombo, Katoi, Kausa, Kifuruka, Kinigi, Musenge, Mutiko. The list is very long. The mapping exercise team clarifies the limits of its competence, saying that, quote, the mapping exercise is not a judicial mechanism and the evidence gathered is not sufficient to satisfy the high standard required by the courts, end of quote. In other words, the report provides preliminary evidence to guide future investigators and judges when time comes to identify the people responsible for the alleged crimes. In Kigali, where most suspects are, the government attempted to thwart this report using diplomatic blackmail. The government spokeswoman and foreign minister Louise Mushikiwabo declared that, quote, attempts to take action on this report, either through its release or leaks to the media, will force us to withdraw from Rwanda's various commitments to the United Nations, especially in the area of peacekeeping, end of quote. Curiously, her president, Paul Kagame, would make the world believe that nothing of that kind had ever been envisaged. That's not on the table. Kagame was quoted by the Wall Street Journal as saying in late September in New York. The same journal went on to write, quote, Mr. Kagame said he had never made such a threat, but added that if the UN decided to pursue the report's allegations in court, he would reconsider, end of quote. 
Clearly, Kagame has given up and has negotiated some form of impunity which the United Nations seems to have accorded him just to be able to count on 3,500 Rwandan soldiers in Darfur. Of course, the recent history of Liberia shows that Charles Taylor negotiated and obtained a peaceful departure from power only to be arrested later in Nigeria. It is then possible to imagine that at the end of Kagame's current presidential term in 2017, if the constitution is not modified, Ban Ki-moon and the team that signed the suspected tacit deal will have gone. This the deal will have no significance anymore in the eyes of the new UN leadership by 2017. Another possibility could be that Kagame accepted the release of the report, which anyway he could not block, knowing that no tribunal has the competence to judge him. The ICTR in Arusha cannot prosecute him because its jurisdiction is limited to the crimes committed in 1994. The International Criminal Court, on its part, can only prosecute crimes committed after 2002. There remain two options, a special international tribunal and national jurisdictions. The first option is not likely because it would cost much money. The second is the most likely of all. The Netherlands, for instance, is in the process of amending its laws on crimes against humanity and genocide to allow Dutch courts to prosecute crimes committed before 2003. What is sure is that the report has changed everything on the academic, diplomatic, political and geostrategic arenas. The remaining part is, as the logic suggests, to know if the alleged crimes will be punished. The first step is made, namely the one of acknowledging that crimes were committed, where and how they were committed. The second is to bring the alleged criminals to court.